Hello and welcome to Oil Market Insight. We're coming to you from the OPEC headquarters here in Vienna and today we're going to take a look at the state of the oil market. Taking a look back at how the market has been since we met here in December and of course taking a look at where we are now and hopefully a look ahead too and I have a tremendous panel of experts here to help us and to join us. So I'd like to introduce um, to you Cornelia Meyer. She is the CEO of MRL Corporation based in London. Thanks for joining us Cornelia. Thank you. We're also joined by Kate Dorian. She's an independent oil analyst based in Dubai, keeping an eye on the Middle East and indeed the, the wider region as well. And also from Texas, America. Thanks so much for joining us. Jason Schenker, the president of Prestige Economics. Now, I want to start with you, Jason, because when we look at global growth and when we look at what's going on in terms of global oil demand, it really comes down to what's going on in America for the most part particularly recently when we look at job figures and housing stats and that. Give us a feel and bring us up to date in terms of what are things looking at like right now. Sure. You know, in the first quarter of this year, we saw some improvements of growth over last year. Um, things have slowed a little bit in the last couple of months, but in general, this year should be the fourth year in a row of getting rich slowly, where U.S. GDP remains around 2%. It's not the 4% numbers that people are hoping for, um, but it's, it's still at least around the 2% level. Level. And so that's a pretty good um, a, a pretty good thing. Next year should be a little bit stronger. Again, especially if we compare this to what's going on in the eurozone or in China, the U.S. looks pretty good right now. You just mentioned there too how the oil price has been, you know, up there over the hundred dollars a barrel. And Jason, I want to bring you in on this because when we look at the economic data that's come out and when we look at the figures, it hasn't been too wonderful for us. We dipped down there below a hundred uh, for Brent crude, I think, in April for just a while. But for the most part, we've seen pretty solid figure, the volatility on the day-to-day, week-to-week, but staying up above $100 a barrel. How have we managed that? Well, you know, I think there's a few things going on. You know, on the one hand, you do have the global economy expanding also at, at sort of a, 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 at a getting rich slowly kind of pace in the 3%-ish uh, plus range, 3 to 3.5% for global GDP this year. That's going to be continually positive for those emerging markets that we just heard about and how they're getting wealthier. So you've got that secular increase. Um, that's really important. That's been supportive. Other things like the Fed's QE infinity, uh, which has uh, en engendered additional demand and loose monetary policy across economies have also helped to try to stimulate growth. And so I think these things are, uh, are, are supportive of prices. In the longer run, you're going to see things like the Fed's expansion of its balance sheets, uh, which is one of the main things holding up U.S. growth, that will eventually weigh on the dollar, uh, which will be supportive of crude prices further out the curve. And again, that brings in the volatility, it brings in the speculation. That's never really gone away, nor will it. I mean, well, what can we do, Jason? There? You know, I think there's a couple of things here. I mean, Cornelius hit on a really great point, which is the per capita GDP consumption for oil, uh, the per capita consumption for oil. If we look at uh, the per capita consumption in the United States, it's more than double that of most European countries. Um, the United States is nine times the level of China, 21 times that of India. So there's a huge headroom for some of these emerging markets. Europe is much more insulated than the United States from those potential shocks. Um, but crude oil, you know, it's fared better than a lot of the other commodities. Uh, if you look at precious metals, which took a huge hit after Cyprus said that they would be selling their gold reserves to finance some of their debt, or if you look at the industrial metals that have been hit particularly hard by China, the price of oil has been much more resilient. And you've seen people and you've seen investors both at the, uh, the retail and the institutional level rotating some of their investments out of commodities and going into equities. Uh, this has been really big and it makes sense from a central bank standpoint, but the price of oil I think is, is, is being supported really more by those global growth dynamics. We see those emerging markets that they continue to grow. That adds the demand. We've got a lot more oil coming out of the U.S. You still have high production coming out of a number of other places. You see increases in production in the Middle East, but it's being absorbed because that emerging market growth continues to rise for transportation fuels. Jason, we hear it's boomtown in America again, that there's uh, plenty of oil on the market there and that there's more oil than we know what to do. And the production figures higher than they've ever been, really, in many years. Yeah, the, you know, there's a lot of oil coming out of the U.S., the, the shale oil and gas revolution in the United States is a very hot topic and everyone wants to talk like about it. It does. In some yeah. places it does and it's very funny because if you go to a city like Houston where the housing market's being bolstered by Fed actions and the economy is being supported by uh, you know once in a generation sort of uh, revolution on oil and gas side um, you know the, the, it feels like a, a really big boom town uh, but the truth is 
you know, these are some of the few cities that are actually holding together the global economy right now in terms of positive year-on-year -year growth, which is very terrifying that, um, that everything hinges there. Something that a lot of people aren't talking about that makes me very concerned are decline curves. If you look at the supply for oil and gas and the shale side of things, the production decline curve is wildly steeper than it is for conventional drilling. And I, a lot of folks don't get that, which means if you want to keep getting all that new oil, you have to keep poking holes in the ground. You have to keep fracking again and again and again and again. And it's a process that doesn't ever end. It's not like deep water where you drill and then, and then you have a, a, a reservoir that you can you pump out of. This, this is a process that, that never ends to get that quantity of oil. And there's not everybody in America supporting this as well. This whole shale oil revolution, while it's happening, I mean, every, not everyone is saying, hey, dig my backyard. Well, a lot of the opposition has faded. I think when we think about opposition, I, I, well, right. I, but, but I think there's a couple other things, too, that, you know, really the American example, as Cornelia pointed out, is very much the exception. There are a few other places where shale oil and gas can be developed. Um, I, I think Mexico's a potential. I think England's a potential. On the continent in Europe, it's much less likely China's going to be a long road and Argentina is going to be quite a ways out. Um, um, you know, these things could happen, but in the U.S. you have a number of things going for it. But even in the U.S., in the next 25 years, we're going to have to spend over $200 billion in infrastructure to get the oil and gas to market. And that's in a very well-developed market. So there's a lot of cost here uh, that's going to, to, to keep, I think, prices uh, buttressed. And that's not going to change. And in terms of trade, I think what we're going to continue to see because the U.S. cannot export oil is we're going to, we are currently a net exporter of petroleum products. We are currently a net exporter of natural gas liquids and of coal. And I think these things are going to continue as we continue to see um, the shale oil and gas revolution play out, which again feeds into the trade flow changes where you see um, more products going uh, out of the U.S. and products that were going there going to Asia and elsewhere. Indeed, the, the dynamics indeed of what has to happen on the global oil market and a lot of issues that everybody's got to be taking into consideration and something the ministers, of course, will be looking at, the state of the economy being probably top of the agenda. I want to thank you all, Jason, thank you so much. Thank Kate you. and Cornelia, thank you so mm -hmm. much for joining us. And thank you all for being with us here on this edition at the 163rd OPEC Conference for Oil Market Insight. Thank you so much for joining us and goodbye.